Okay, so I have Jesse's dogs with me today. This is Finnegan and this is Dukes. I don't run the bed as breaks. So they wouldn't get down and so they're just going to be in the picture. <laughs> they want to hear all about it. Anyway, so today what we wanted to do is talk about three myths of positive reinforcement that are incorrect. They're things that people oftentimes hear and and it can hang them up to the point of not wanting to practice or try, try positive reinforcement. So myth number one is that hand feeding horses creates pushy, mouthy, nosy, muggy, in your space horses. Well, to be honest, it can, <laughs> but, but, it, but when we, it's done correctly, when we do it with the awareness of positive reinforcement and utilizing operant conditioning and being aware of what behavior we're feeding, we turn that right around. I, I mean, it's the very first thing we do is teach them if you want to have food, you need to keep your head to yourself. So we start creating this, they still want to do it, but we give them the right thing to do. Without giving them kind of some guidance and helping them figure out what the right answer is, they're going to come up with their own answers, which are rather invasive sometimes. So what we really want to do instead is be working on, it's the very first thing we work on. As much as we want to be working on simply the classic conditioning and conditioning the bridge signal, the clicker, whichever we want to use, it, you inevitably need to go into some of the operant conditioning and teaching them about keeping appropriate space from, from you. I didn't realize that at first, this wasn't really a marine mammal problem. <laughs> Definitely a horse problem. So I figured it out pretty early, but it is the very first thing we do. So that the myth that hand feeding causes problems is not true unless you are not aware of what you're feeding. But to be honest, any training done poorly, traditional training, pressure release, which is traditional training, when is natural horsemanship, or positive reinforcement, it all is going to, it, it can all go wrong, you know? So as we understand that we wanna click on the behavior we wanna see more of, we have a very simple way to create a new and improved uh, reinforcement history, which results in new choices and them keeping their space and understanding. So myth number one, down. That is not an accurate myth. And actually, to add on to that, I've actually been um, called in to work with horses that are quite aggressive. Some horses to the point where like one horse bit a man's nipple off. Um, another one has keeping, um, will we keep any from, from their stall. Like they want to, they're super aggressive and they want to hurt people. In Mexico, we worked with some horses that were a little intense, you know. And so we have used hand feeding to deal with, and this wasn't the Mexico horses, but to deal with horses who might be aggressive or even food aggressive. We've used hand feeding and food to turn that around. So it's not the food that is the problem, it's the lack of awareness of the timing and, and how powerful, I think it's a great way to tell us how powerful positive reinforcement is. Utilizing food as a reinforcer is very, very powerful. And it can create undesirable behavior if we're not aware of the timing and the relationship between the food and the behavior that's happening. Number, myth number one, <laughs> done. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Okay, myth number two would be that um, they're only going to do things for the food. Well, I think this is an important one. People think I don't want to do it for the food because then they're only going to do it for the food. It's just the food, the food, the food, the food, the food, the food. First thing I want to tell you is if you feel like your training when you're utilizing food is all about the food and that they wouldn't do it without the food, you're, you're missing a component there. And this is really, really important. And this is part of what the marine mammal trainers have been so good at doing. The marine mammal trainers really took the principles of operant conditioning and even classic conditioning. Well, it was, you know, kind of lower on the focus. The operant conditioning took it out of textbooks and put it into a broad practical application. Now, the Baileys worked with it some, but it wasn't a broad application. You didn't have numerous people from numerous walks of life doing it day in, day out to get practical things put together for us. So it really is a marine mammal community that started figuring out how do we really put this into action? One of the things that is super important and it is one of the things we focus on in teaching people, this is a systematic approach. When we start positive reinforcement in a systematic way, we are looking 
to to fade is the food a part of it it is a huge part of it it'll always be a part of it but as we teach each behavior we utilize classic conditioning to come up behind it and we create a good association and pretty soon they just love doing the behavior they don't feel like i am entitled to the food or else i will not do the behavior they're like i love counter departs why wouldn't i do a counter depart you know because we've done it in a systematic way so this is the art part folks I, it is not easy to always see the difference but this is the art and i want to remind you I, I tell people all the time there was a study that was done in the late 60s and what they did is they gave animals um free food then they took that away and they taught them to hit a lever for food so now this has become a strong behavior. They understand how to get the food. They hit the lever, get the food, hit the lever, get the food. It's, it's you know, they it's working. And so then they give them both options back. And what do you think the result was? They tend to ignore the free food and go to the lever for food. So the training, when done correctly, is not all about the food. Now the food has been a part of it. And from that study, they started with pigeons, I believe, and then went to other animals, came a term called contra freeloading. But it's really basically saying it, it's not all about the food. It's about playing the game. And, and this is an analogy that you people that have seen me at clinics have heard or, or follow diligently have heard plenty. It really, to me, it's like doing a crossword puzzle. I love doing crossword puzzles. Nobody feeds me for crossword puzzles. I don't always get it right. I may stress through it. Sometimes I um, do it really well. Sometimes it's a real struggle, but I love the crossword puzzles. It is something that I love to do. And you think about it, most people enjoy games. They like playing games, whether they're board games or card games or video games or sport games. It's things that we like to do and we like the, the maybe and the try and earning our way through it. It is not about the food, it is not about money. In fact, we can, make, we can take the joy out of it by making it too mechanistic and too tied up with food. So it's important to keep the joy and the fun in the training while moving on. So if they, you feel like it's all about the food and in the beginning, the food of a particular behavior, the food is super important and we utilize that and we, we, you know, it's part of the classic conditioning that shapes the behavior, but pretty soon, one of the things we never do, we keep raising the criteria a little bit all the time, small enough that they get the right answer, but big enough that the game is on. So we start the game and we want the game to be afoot because the game, think about it like this, with the marine mammals, they got all of their food each and every day, regardless of what they did or didn't do. They got all their social interactions each and every day, regardless of what they did or did not do. So why did they do it? And we were expected to get very high criteria. So why'd they do it? Because it was fun. We showed up and they were excited that the humans were there. So much so that if, if, if a, a, you know, a dolphin didn't come over and, and show up, we may start thinking he might not be well. You know, it, we, we would wait until the next one, but it's, they, they showed up because we were fun and it was fun to do the training. So the training should always be fun. But if, if they're not doing it for the reward, they're doing it for the relief from the pressure. So keeping in mind, when we use pressure and release, we are providing um, a, an aversive that they want to go away. So they're working hard for that aversive to go away. If the pressure did not have, or whatever we're using, which is typically some sort of pressure, and, and whether it's displacement or physical you know, like burrs or leg, if, if they didn't want the pressure to go away, if, if they didn't care, then when the pressure went away, it would not increase the frequency of behavior. They'd be like, man, who cares? So it's important that we get them to understand, hello, man. It's important that we recognize they're either doing it for the avoidance of aversive or the, the, the hope of a, an appetitive, something that makes them feel good. So something they like, something they desire. And a lot of people talk about petting, but petting, you know, do you think you could get your horse to jump three, six, jump in the middle of the ring without a rider or a person, you know, for a pet? Not so much, but you can for food. So food is just much more salient, much stronger. It's a primary reinforcement. It's one of the things they need to survive. So they, as we have the aversive or we have, uh, they're either getting something they want or avoiding something they don't want. So those people that say the horse is only doing it for the treat, 
Well, let's keep in mind through traditional training, they're only doing it to avoid the aversive. So in order to ramp up the criteria, you typically have to ramp up the degree of pressure or the threat of the pressure that you're applying. So that's myth number two. So when people say they're only doing it for the food, if it's done correctly and in a systematic way, we fade the food and the target and the clicker from each behavior. It doesn't mean we might not randomly go back to it and reinforce them, but it's not dependent on those things. So we're trying to avoid that sense of entitlement. Okay, of course that's anthropomorphic, but that's how it feels. Okay, and finally, the other myth that I think we hear quite a bit is now as positive reinforcement has become more accepted in the world, there's now this kind of qualification saying, oh, well, that's for your recreational rider or not even rider. It's for groundwork. It's not for serious competitors. It's not for serious behaviors. It's not for, you know, the more intense, serious situations. And I, when that just tells me people don't really know how to do it yet because it absolutely training is training is training. I don't care what you're training them to do. Utilizing the positive reinforcement is a very powerful tool in keeping the good emotions, keeping the relaxation. With the clicker, we have a way to tell them that that little nuance of that shoulder turn just a little bit, and we can say that piece, and then we're reinforcing them with something that they value. Doing, working with them under saddle is no different than working them on the ground. The placement is different. The use of the cues and that we're up on them now is different. But the training should not be different or feel different. We still want to try to teach them uh, most of those behaviors on the ground first or without a rider, without the pressure of tack or equipment to, to create it. But once they get it, we may start introducing the equipment if it's a necessity for the showing we're doing, you know, but we don't want it to be the tool that creates it. The tool, the impetus behind the behavior, we want it to be positive reinforcement. We want the good emotions. We want the good associations. We want the partner. We want the, the problem solver who's with it and invested in the training with us. We want the horse who suits up ready to play. When we start pulling out the saddle, they start nickering. And I hope it's my turn. And that happens. So we want that, but it's just, we're operating from a different place. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have a different relationship. And it's, I think it's easy though, for people to slip into the old aids. You know, we, everybody has a strong reinforcement history mostly with doing things like they've always done. So now as we come along with a new way to do things and a new sensation that we have to, that we, it, that part I think is hard for us, but really to the horse, if we can continue using the positive reinforcement, continue using choice, showing them what they use, we can use those same cues and use them simply as cues with the impetus for the behavior, what created the behavior, what got that emitted that behavior to have positive reinforcement behind it. We have all those, that relationship, those emotions behind it, that relaxation, as opposed to I better do it or else something might happen. So it is, it, it, we can use the same cues, but we need to be thoughtful about the reinforcement history and how we created that behavior. So that takes a little bit of technical help sometimes, but it absolutely is for the big stuff, the serious stuff, as much as it is for the, the husbandry behaviors, which let's admit it, if you can't get your husbandry behaviors done, you are not gonna have a horse to show. So the, the husbandry behaviors are as important, if you can't treat a horse and tend to a horse, they're as important as the, the ridden stuff, but we kind of have a tendency to categorize that and compartmentalize it, I guess, a little bit differently. But honestly, it's for everything under the sun. And again, as a reminder, worked with a number of Olympians in, in the past, John and Beasy being one of them, and, and it's just as effective for, for training and, and figuring out how to get it done. So those are three, I think, of the big myths that we hear quite a bit that I think, I thought it's a good time just to address those. We'll have to address them again and again because people forget, the new people come along, but it's really important that we have a way to address some of those as positive reinforcement is becoming more mainstream and more understood. Granted, we have a long way to go, but we have, you know, 10,000 people in some Facebook groups. Once upon a time, there was never, never that many people in the world that knew about positive reinforcement in horses. So we've come a long way, we have a long way to go, but as it's getting more understood, more accepted, the science 
is becoming unpacked a little bit for people, we need to still keep reminding them some of those pieces that can hang people up. So there you go. That's it. The three little myths and getting them sorted out and, and, and trying to, to kind of set the record straight on some of that science. Okay, that's it for now, you guys. Me and all my little doggy friends say, um, say bye for now. <laughs>